Wonderful. I see we have a lot of participants on already. I am going to get us started. So thank you so much everyone for joining us today and welcome to the French American Foundation's 34th Annual Translation Prize Ceremony. My name is Katie Damali. I direct programs at the foundation. Today, we celebrate the art of translation and how it builds bridges between nations and cultures. In this case, of course, between France and the United States. On screen, you see the winners, you see the guests of honor, and you see the jurors. And so we're very excited to have everyone. This is a year of celebration and new beginnings at the French American Foundation. Uh, for some recent news about us, this summer we're welcoming our new president, Caroline Narolasidi, who's a highly regarded leader in the nonprofit community. Caroline joins the foundation following a, success, a successful tenure at the Lycée Français of New York. Uh, this fall, we're also celebrating the 40-year anniversary of the Young Leaders Program. I know many of you who are joining us now will soon have the pleasure of meeting Caroline and of attending the foundation's in-person events later this year. But now onto the prize. Since 1986, the foundation has awarded an annual prize for the best translations from French into English in the categories of fiction and nonfiction. With the generous and longstanding support of the Florence Gould Foundation, we've awarded translators of nearly 80 books over the past three and a half decades, representing dozens of publishers, both large and small. This year was a very competitive year in which our jury of five professionals evaluated more than 70 submissions. So bravo to the jury for this monumental task. You see jurors Esther Allen, Tess Lewis, and James Swenson on screen. I salute you. And let's not forget Emmanuel Artel and Samuel Martin, who are also integral members of this year's jury. Uh, to the audience in the email with your Zoom link, you've also received a brochure for today that contains the biographies of the winners, the composition of the jury, and a description of all 10 finalists, all wonderful books. And I'd encourage you to take a look and follow along. And if you have questions or comments from the winners, that's also encouraged. You can write your questions in the Q&A box or the chat boxes below. Um, today, we're recognizing the work of two translators, Chris Andrews for his translation of Our Riches by Kauter Adimi, published by New Directions and Hoyt Rogers for his translation of Rome 1630, The Horizon of the Early Baroque, followed by five essays on 17th century art by Yves Bonnefoy, published by Seagull Books and distributed by the University of Chicago Press. But before we get to these winners, to start off our celebration of translation, we're excited to hear from our guest of honor, Cole Swenson, and our jury member, Tess Lewis. I have the pleasure of introducing Tess, who will then introduce Cole, and we will begin a conversation about translation with the help of these experts. So Tess Lewis is an essayist, a translator from French and German, and an advisory editor for the Hudson Review. She's been awarded grants from Penn USA, Penn UK, and the NEA, the ACFNY Translation Prize, and the 2017 Penn Translation Prize, and most recently, a Guggenheim Fellowship. She has served as co-chair of the Penn Translation Committee and served on our Translation Prize jury this year. So Tess and Cole, I will pass it to you and allow you to get us started. Thank you so much. Many of you in the audience will know uh, Cole Swenson from her um, many volumes of uh, luminous, exuberant, and innovative poetry from her critical essays from her studies of art and from her many translations from the French. It is my great honor and pleasure to speak with you uh, today, Cole, in honor of this year's translation prize, because your work, your poetry, your prose, and your translations have an essential affinity, I find, with the works translated by this year's winner, uh, Chris Andrews and Hoyt Rogers. And that is a view of the arts, verbal, visual, and intellectual, not as a luxury, but as a lifeline, as necessary to our existence as food, clothing, and shelter. And to me, uh, this is a sensibility that, that Jean Flamont, the French writer, shares. You translated four of his books, most recently his luminous intimate portrait of Louise Bourgeois, now now Louison, which was a finalist for last year's French American Foundation Translation Prize. So uh, I guess my first question is, what drew you to Jean Flamel's work in particular? 
Uh, in fact, it's because of his connection to the arts. I find that he's working in a really unique mode of ekphrasis. And ekphrasis, writing on visual art, obviously has an extremely long history, uh, often giving a poet the occasion to deeply contemplate a given work. But with Fremont, he really takes it beyond that and shows us the way in which a work of art is never isolated. It's always part of a rich cultural and historical context. And through his wonderful styling, he gives us the sense of the arts is always interrelated, always pointed toward the future, and always in conversation and a progressive conversation with the whole, um, the whole of the culture. Uh, his current mode, a mode he's increasingly been working with for the past several years, is that of short prose vignettes that incorporate biography, history, aesthetic commentary, anecdote, uh, all of which gives a sense of the warm, ongoing life of art, even if we're looking at a medieval piece, it remains alive through his evocations in that way. Um, I also really love translating his work because it's always an invitation to research. I have to go and look up works and artistic processes and how paint was made in the Middle Ages and all these various things. So I'm not just translating words. I have the opportunity to feel like I'm translating a whole cultural moment as well. That certainly comes true, comes through in Now Now Louison. There is a Louise Bourgeois uh, exhibition at the Jewish Museum and I'm fortunate to be able to go this weekend and I found that um, having read uh, your translation of Jean Fremont's uh, portrait of Louise Bourgeois' life made it a much richer experience. It would have been rich enough on its own, but it's true that he manages to distill sort of the, the essential core of an artist in very few words. Um, and so I, I suppose um, if you could talk to us a bit about um, the particular challenges in translating his works that you had to face in general, but but also with Now Now Louison. Uh, well, you know, will make, give us an insight into the mechanics of his prose. Um, as you say, I've translated a number of his works and over a period now of almost 30 years. And so there's an interesting way that I find such a voice that I've worked with for so long becomes internalized. And so that really helps. But that said, the challenge with Now Now Louison was tone. Uh, the tone is very, very particular. And the tone in that case is actually, I was gonna say more important than content, except actually tone is content in that case. And he caught this amazing, have um, collaboration in her personality of wisdom, resignation, even melancholy and sarcasm. Uh, it's a really unusual combination of, of personality features and it marked her. She was a strident, very at times difficult woman, but also a wonderful and open one. And so Jean had to capture all of that uh, and somehow created on the page. And he did that largely through tone. Um, I was thinking about tone as having so much to do not only with the meaning of the words, but importantly with the sound and rhythm. That's mm -hmm. how we get that tone. And so for a translator, I can always do the meaning of the words, but how I find the meaning of those words with an appropriate rhythm sound combination. Uh, that was, was really, it was the challenge and it was the fun. Um, to also, too, I think one thing that's important to recognize with that book is that uh, Jean had developed a relationship with Louise Bourgeois as her first gallerist in France um, over decades. So he had a very well-developed and very 
intricate, multifaceted understanding of her nature. So he had a lot to bring to the surface of his text. So I had to get that too. And so I talked with him over, I worked on it for over two years and talked to him countless times, knowing that I needed to have that same understanding. Obviously I couldn't have it in as much depth as he has it, but I needed to get all that background information so that it could inform the text as well. So uh, conversation again, played a huge role uh, in, in that. Which is interesting. Your answer is interesting on several levels. It's sparking all sorts of ideas. Um, on the one hand, and now now Louison is an internal conversation. Louise is uh, bourgeois, not Clément imagines Louise Bourgeois not only talking to herself, but she's addressed figures in her life. And the title for me is a snapshot of the hurdles that you face. I saw an online interview of Clément talking about the title. It turns out that it, he took it from an etching um, or engraving that has the English words be calm on a sort of egg-shaped blue background. And he imagined that, you know, Louise Bourgeois was aware of her excessive or her transports, emotional transports, and would not say calm down to herself, but he, the, the sort of emotional dynamic was there. So he translated the be calm into calme-toi, disons, the nickname that her father had given to her. And um, I imagine you were faced with, you know, sound, meaning, emotion, tone, all these things to, uh, that you had to reflect in a short title. So how did you settle on Now Now Louison, which is a bit of a departure superficially, but it captures the essence for me of the title. That is a great point. Uh, and it underscores collaboration as always trans, um, collaboration always playing a major role in translation, which is to say that that actually wasn't my choice for a title. Oh, well, uh, true. I, I, I went around and Jean and I discussed it extensively, um, calm down, Louison would have been a, a one that's right there. Um, we ended up choosing it in collaboration with the original publisher of the text, um, Les Fugitifs in London, and the person, the main editor there, Cécile Menon, wanted that title. And so Jean and I talked about it, and, as you say, we found too that it captures the emotional spirit. We could picture Louise Bourgeois saying, now, now, Louison. And so we just decided to go with it. And personally, I like that fact that, again, translation just complicates voice in such an important way. And it can absorb all these, the publisher's voice. Uh, a critic's voice, a friend's voice who says, well, wait a minute, I do it that way. That unlike the original text, which has a single voice, uh, always getting input, of course, but it nonetheless, it has a stability of surface that a translation never has. A translation is this volatile sense of exchange and it retains that to me, even after it's published. Yeah. Um that brings me to um, a question I'd like to ask about the um, sort of the interrelationships of your poetry and your translation. The pieces in your book, On Walking On, uh, to me, distill the various writers' uh, essential spirits um, as persuasively as Flamel does. You, you have uh, prose poems and poems about writers who walked. Um, one writer that makes an appearance in um, On Walking On and is an abiding spirit in Flamel's work is Robert Walser. And this then, think of a line in your poetry collection, Goest, about, quote, a love of things that interlock. And you've made a very compelling presentation of um, description of translation as an interlocking process. 
are tra translation and poetry interlocked for you? Um, yes, definitely. Um, with be being so involved in translation, it means that I'm constantly um, working with reading in a different way. I'm, I always think of translation as reading spherically in a certain way, that you're much more aware of the connotations, the associations, you have to be. So that kind of reading, I think, plays into a different kind of writing where the role of the spherical, the associations, the connotations, uh, I tend to think I don't write linearly, I write spherically, and it's because of translation. Translation has contributed that to me, uh, but there are also many more uh, influences and effects that are perhaps more traceable and more direct. Um, things like uh, the incorporation of the valser. I've always loved valser's work long before I met Jean. So, but I was just delighted, and I've, I've translated a book of his on his writings uh, about. Valser, where he effectively takes Valser's voice. And I know that definitely must have influenced that the piece that's in on Walking On. But actually, um, a much greater influence shows up in a book that just came out of mine called Art in Time. And it's, I, it's ekphrastic, but in that case, I wanted to be able to incorporate more statements of an art historical nature as well as having the sort of flights of lyric dissolve. And so I found myself writing these pieces that are half essay, half lyric poetry, but that incorporate uh, biography, history, aesthetic analysis, anecdote. And when I saw that, I thought, oh, that's exactly the list I would and did use to describe Jean Fremont's work. So I thought, thank you, Jean. Uh, this is really, I really appreciate that. And, um, and I realize that that's what I often end up doing is thanking the people that I translate for their influences, for their insights, for their collaboration, for their conversation, uh, and, and just for the fun of it all. Yes, I, I find that translation is an in, invitation into a whole new world each time the world of the writer um, that you're that you're taking on. Unfortunately, we don't have much time left, but I do want to ask, do you have a current translation project or are you mulling something over to work on next? Seven. <laughs> I'm working on Jean Fremont's um, Rue de Regard, which is short vignettes. Um, and on the visual arts. Um, I'm working on Suzanne Do Pelt's new bestiary that's coming out. That's also an ekphrastic piece in that she's addressing animals that show up in various arts. Um, I'm working on a piece by uh, DJ Borda on the mix of French and indigenous languages in Eastern Canada, mixing in with the geology. So those are the three that come to mind, but I always seem, and also Pierre Alferi's new book uh, that just came out from POL. I did the first section of that for a program that we did just last week. So uh, I love to juggle the projects, to have lots of things uh, on, on back burners and front burners at the same time. And also I'd like to thank uh, the French American Foundation uh, and all of you involved for inviting me. It is indeed a great honor to have been invited and to have the occasion to talk about my favorite activity. Well, it's, it's, it's a pleasure and honor to have you um, come and celebrate this year's winners uh, with us. We have so many things to look forward uh, to from you, Cole, not just your translations, but your new works as well. And now um, we will pass the baton to Esther Allen and raise a glass to uh, one of Chris Andrews, whom she will introduce. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank, thank you very much. That was absolutely wonderful, uh, Cole and Tess. I enjoyed listening to that and I wanna know more about every single one of the projects that you just mentioned, Cole. Um, but 
as uh, Tess said, it's now time to turn our attention to another phenomenal literary figure, uh, Chris Andrews. Um, so first let me introduce him and then I'm going to invite him um, to speak a little bit and read perhaps from the work for which he is being awarded this prize. Um, whenever in the past 15 years or so, I've been asked which translator I most admire, I have to confess, the first name that comes to mind is Chris Andrews. So I am greatly honored and delighted to introduce him here. And I'm also quite astonished. After all, we are here to give the French American Foundation Prize for a translation from French. Chris Andrews, as many of you are very well aware, is renowned for his translations from Spanish of Roberto Bolaño, for example, whom Chris was the first to translate into English. Chris won the Premio Valle Clan from the British Society of Authors in 2005 for his translation of Bolaño's Distant Star. He went on to translate many other works by Bolaño and is sort of one of the two fundamental translators of Bolaño into English who created this phenomenon that Bolaño's career has become. And he eventually wrote a brilliant study titled Roberto Bolaño's Fiction and Expanding Universe, one of the best studies of Bolaño's work we have, which came out from Columbia University Press six years ago. Not content with having introduced one epoch-making American writer to the Anglophone world, Chris subsequently began translating the legendary Argentine writer Cesar Ayra, who is himself famously a translator. Um, there's a lot to say about that, but I'll just tell you one thing. Uh, several years ago, I saw Ira interviewed by Rivka Galchin in McNally Jackson Bookstore in Manhattan. Think of it, a large crowd of people gathered together in a single room. Um, from our perspective now, a wildly amazing and implausible thing. But at the time, it seemed perfectly natural. Um, there we all were in each other's presence, and Ira was asked about his translator. He paused, he took a deep breath, and he said quietly, Chris Andrews is a genius. Here I have to note, chiming in with Ira, that Chris Andrews is also a poet. He was awarded the prestigious Anthony Hecht Prize, chosen by the late Mark Strand in 2011, for his second collection of poetry, Lime Green Chair. Well, I was always aware that Chris teaches French and I've seen him draw on many French sources and writers, particularly Raymond Queneau in the various lectures that I've had the good fortune uh, to attend. I did not know that Chris also translated from the French. And in fact, he didn't. Chris has confirmed that Cauter Adimi's No Richesse is the very first book he has ever translated from the French. But of course, it isn't as if New Directions were taking a risk on a fledgling translator when they commissioned this book from Chris. And here we are. Chris Andrews is undoubtedly the first and perhaps the only translator in our time and in history to be awarded the Premio Valle in Clan for a translation from Spanish, the Anthony Hecht Prize for his own poetry and the French American Foundation Translation Prize. Before turning things over to Chris, who lives in Australia, where it is currently well after 3 a.m. So it is truly heroic of him to be attending this gathering at all. I want to read a statement of appreciation of Chris and his work that was sent to the French American Foundation by Cauter Adimi, the author of Our Riches, the novel whose translation by Chris has been awarded this prize. The prize also, of course, honors Cauter Adimi, and it also represents a first for her. The seven books she has published to date have received a great deal of recognition and have won many prizes, including the Prix Littéraire de la Vocation for her first novel and the Prix Renaudot de Lycéens for No Richesse, among other awards. Even so, this is the first of the six books she has published to appear in English translation. So this prize marks a very auspicious new beginning in a new language for her, as well as for her translator. And here is the statement that Cauter Adimi sent 
Um, she says, Chris's translation is the work of both an artisan and an artist. An artisan because he takes great care with detail, finding le mot juste. I salute his savoir faire. And an artist, because to put a twist on the old saying, traduire ce n'est pas toujours trahir. To translate is not always to betray. Sometimes it is to create a bridge between two languages. I thank Chris for having translated my novel with so much talent. My novel, which, as you know, is about the necessity of literature and the importance of all those who contribute to supporting literature, booksellers, editors, and of course, translators. I'm lucky to be published by a house such as New Directions and Paris Andrews as a translator. Thank you to them and thank you to the foundation for giving Chris this recognition. And I will just add to what Caltech said that by its new direction, publishers, beloved by all of us here, is celebrating the 85th anniversary of its founding on this very day. And Chris, I'm sure that you join me in sending them enormous congratulations and wishing them many more wonderful decades and centuries of existence. Chris. Thank, thank you very much, Esther, for those um, for those generous words. And of course, I do, I do yes congratulate New Directions on eighty five years of existence. Um, and and thank you also for for reading that statement from from Kauter Adimi. I'd I'd like to, if I can, um, thank the French American Foundation and the Florence School Foundation for organising and funding this prize, and the jury for having chosen our riches. I want to say also that it was a real honor to be on a short list alongside translators whose work I admire, and in some cases also use regularly in my teaching and research. There's a famous book by Lawrence Venuti entitled The Translator's Invisibility, but editors I think are even more invisible. So I would like to thank Barbara Epler of New Directions, not just for publishing our riches, but also for wielding her blue pencil with exquisite skill. Michelle de Kretzer read the translation before I submitted it, and as always made wonderfully sharp-eyed suggestions. I want to thank also Brittany Dennison, who checked the eligibility conditions for this prize and entered the book. And finally, of course, I'm very grateful to the author, Kauter Adimi, for having written such a powerful and, and delicate novel. So I would like to say a, a few words about the book before talking perhaps about one of the challenges that it presented for translation. Our Riches, it traces the journey of a space through time. It's a small space, the, the, book, the bookstore named Les Vraies Richesses in, in Algiers. And the times are turbulent from the 1930s to 2017, taking in the Second World War, the struggle for Algerian independence, and the dark de decade of terrorism in the 1990s. Kauter Adimi moves from the grand sweep to the domestic interior, braiding the stories of three men who successively occupy the book's central space, each in his way. Edmond Charlot, the founder and animating spirit of Les Vraies Richesses, Abdallah, who worked there as a loans officer after the store became a branch of the National Library, and Riyad, an engineering student who is required by his internship to clear out and repaint the premises, which are destined to house a beignet outlet. Charlot is a quixotic, generous obsessive, a kind of all-round cultural agitator. And he has an inspiring ideal, which is to bring together the literatures of the Mediterranean without distinctions of language, religion, or nationality. But one of the novel's great strengths is that it makes the gap between ideal and reality clear. Charlot is blindsided by the political and economic forces that grind his dream away. And yet that dream haunts the space that Abdallah is determined to protect from its reluctant destroyer, Riyadh. The novel lets us see what Charlot couldn't, but also recovers his idealism as a part of Algeria's true riches. It's a hymn to all the trades of the book and an album of scenes from a nation's torn history and a clear-eyed homage to a city. So perhaps I can take you a little further into the novel by mentioning one of the challenges that it presented for a translator, which was to, to actually to, to connect with something that Cole Swenson was saying, uh, this is a challenge relating to tone. 
Um, in this case, the, the challenge was to preserve the tonal contrasts um, because the novel has three main strands narrated from the points of view of Charlot, Riyadh, and a choral we. Each of these strands has a distinctive tone. Charlot's strand is made up of diary entries that have been very cleverly invented by Adimi using historical documents and correspondence and interviews with people who knew him. So the tone there is clipped and urgent because Charlot is full of enthusiasm but constantly time poor. And he has moments of professional glory, for example, when he publishes Camus' first book, L'envers et l'endroit, Betwixt and Between. But his attempt to establish Edition Charlot in Paris after the war comes sadly undone. His talented writers begin to abandon him. He loses control of the finances. The quota system starves him of paper and the established players are not going to make room for some colonial upstart. Riyadh's strand is narrated briskly and humorously in the third person. He's not at all interested in literature and he'd rather be back in Paris with his girlfriend. It's cold and wet and initially the locals do everything they can to impede his work. But after a while he gets to know Abdullah and the other people in the Rue Hanani. And this strand of the book builds up a very rich picture of life in Algiers in the late 20 teens, late in the reign of President Bouteflika, before the, the Hirak, the, the massive ongoing protest movement that began in 2019. The We Strand revisits key moments in Algeria's colonial and post-colonial history, and the tone there is sober and often somber appropriately. These parts of the book are like the chorus of a tragedy, at one point, after seeing a film about the first years of Algerian independence, Riyadh says to his girlfriend, everything is always tragic in Algeria. And she laughs, thinking this is a joke, but it's not really. There's a lot of precise joinery in our riches, but the joins don't disappear. The transitions from one strand to another are often striking and eloquent, and they catch the reader off guard. So it was important to try not to flatten those tonal contrasts. So I might, I might um, uh, stop there and um, see um, what Esther has, has to ask me. Um, Chris, we had hoped maybe you might, uh, well, would you like to read just a bit from um, Norichesse? Or uh, would you prefer uh, to, to go on talking about it? I have some questions for you. May, uh, I, I didn't actually choose a passage to read so maybe oh. more questions then let me ask you some questions um well i love i absolutely love this um summation of the book that you just said it traces the journey of a space through time um so my first question is actually about that space um my my wonderful friend burton pike who translated robert Musil's the man without qualities had been working on the project for years and years when he suddenly realized he'd never been to Vienna. So he hopped a flight and spent a weekend in Vienna sort of seeing all of the things that he'd been describing. And, and I wonder what was your relationship to Algiers when you did this translation? Um, have, you, have you been in that place? Was it, how did that work? No, I haven't. I haven't been to Algiers. Um, I did use Google Earth to... <laughs> To look at it, as I guess translators are doing more and more these days. Um, and I think what one of the one of the, the great qualities of the book is the way that it it does create a very strong sense of place in a very short space. Um, so I think Kauter Hadimi is one of these authors who has the talent of, of selecting and arranging um details to evoke a sense of space very very economically i think that's a mysterious skill um it's hard to you know it's hard to say how that works but she certainly has that skill uh, are you yearning to go to algiers having yes, done the translation i mean the end the ending of the book is almost like a travel journal of like walking through the town through the the streets the various quartiers Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. The, 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 the beginning and the end have that, have that um, guiding, guiding the reader, you know, in, in his places in central Algeria. Well, hopefully I'd love to when COVID, yeah. you know, lifts the barriers. Yeah, that, that can be your first trip. Yeah. Um, the, my, yeah. the other question I, I really wanted to ask you about is how did you reach this book? How did this book come to you? How did this translation happen? 
it was a, a somewhat circuitous path. So I'm, I first heard about, I, I heard a radio interview with Kautia Radimi in 2017 when she published the book. And I thought, gosh, that sounds interesting. So I, I ordered a copy and read it and I, I, I loved it. And I thought, I'd like to translate this book and I was applying for study leave from my from my teaching job at the time, so I I built um, into the project the an idea of translating a book, and then you know I needed to get referees for the for the study leave, so I asked Barbara Epler at New Directions if she would write me a letter of reference, and she um, she did very kindly, and she was intrigued by the short description of the book that was in the application for study leave. Um, and so her publisher's ears um, pricked up and she asked for a longer reader's report. Coincidentally, at the same time, Tainan Kogane from New Directions had been gathering intelligence about um, uh, publishing prospects in, in Paris and he'd been hearing uh, positive reports about the book. So he was enthusiastic too. So these, these things came together and, um, and, and Barbara secured the rights to the book and that, that's that's how I got to translate it. <laughs> well, so it all happened because you happened to switch on the radio at the right time one day in 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Imagine if someone had come to the door at that moment. Yeah. <laughs> we wouldn't be yeah. here right now. Yeah. Um, so, I, and one more question I have for you, uh, which I hope you'll forgive me for asking, but I can't help it. Um, most of your career, has been spent doing translations of Latin American men, not only Bolaño and Ayure, but Rodrigo Rey Rosa and others. And I've noticed that in the past three or four years, um, you've been you've turned to translating women. Yeah, you translated Gauter and also Selva Almada, the uh, the Argentine writer. And of course, you are married, as you as you acknowledge, to a very celebrated woman writer, Michelle de Kretzer. Um, was this something deliberate? This turn towards translating women, or how did this happen? Well, the I've been. I mean, I was very. I, I've had a couple of strokes of luck early in, in, in my translating career, getting to translate um, By Night in Chile by, um, by Bolaño and uh, uh, an episode in the life of a landscape painter by Cesar Aida. And so a lot of the work I've done has flowed from those, from, you know, th those opportunities that I had early on. Um, and it's, it wasn't really a deliberate um, decision to go looking for books by women, but um, but I'm very glad to have have been able to to translate both Selva Almada and Kauter Hadimi, and I hope in the future I'll be able to to continue to translate more women. Definitely, yeah. So so it wasn't that deliberate, but now that you're doing it, uh, because there is of course this issue that fewer women get translated, which I'm sure is something that Michelle faces in her. So it makes a lot of sense to, yeah. to continue. Yeah. I, I think that we might be out of time. Um, so Chris, again, it's 3 a.m. in Australia. You look completely <laughs> alert and wide awake. Maybe you're a night owl, I don't know. No, I'm not. <laughs> well, thank you so much for staying up and for being with us. It's been really great talking to you. And um, now we will turn things over to yet another translator who has one foot in the Spanish speaking world, um, Hoyt Rogers and uh, James Swenson. Um, thank you, Chris. Thank you, Esther. Good afternoon, everyone. It's my very, very great pleasure to uh, present this award uh, for the best prize for translation of nonfiction to Hoyt Rogers for his translation of Yves Bonnefoy's Rome 1630. Uh, Hoyt Rogers is uh, a poet, a translator, an interpreter, uh, and uh, a writer. Um, he uh, has translated from the Spanish, as well as from the French, I think also from German and Italian. Um, he was one of the people who translated Borges's selected poetry, but he's above all known for his translations of Yves Bonnefoy and André de Boucher. 
Um, this book is the fifth book of Bonfoise that he's translated. The others are books of poetry, and Rome 1630 is a uh, book of art history. Um, it is an extraordinarily beautiful book published by Siegel Press, which I'm showing you here. Uh, it is both compact, it is not a huge book the way a lot of uh, art history books are big coffee table books, but it is extraordinarily well illustrated. Uh, and it was a real, real pleasure for all of us to, uh, to read uh, while we were uh, voting to award it among a very, very competitive field. Um, Yves Bonfoy is one of the great poets, one of the sort of last great poets of the French tradition. Um, he is the sort of French writer who you would always call a writer. Many French writers you would refer to as a writer and intellectual. Uh, Bonfoy, you would simply call a writer. Um, it's not that he wasn't an intellectual. He is, in fact, a very, very intellectual poet. He's also a very sensuous poet. Um, he was a poet of great intensity. I had the... Uh, the privilege of taking a course with him uh, when I was in graduate school. And the combination of the beauty of his voice and the intensity of his gaze uh, was just uh, an overwhelming uh, presence. He was a man of great charisma uh, and a man of tremendous ideas. Um, one of the things that's most remarkable about this book, and that I will invite Hoyt to comment upon, is the level at which it is pitched. It is a book that is simultaneously concrete and abstract. Um, Bonfoy's goal is to discern the fundamental commitments that are present in the various painters of the early Baroque whom he discusses. And I'm going to read a passage to illustrate this a little bit. This is from most of the way through the primary essay, Rome 1630, where Bonfoy is discussing Poussin. And he says, I conclude that it is perhaps the first modern painting, that is the miracle of the ark, the first picture that has in itself and not in some God or value, its infinity, its sacrality, its ultimate aim. And to the relations between this newfound quest and the conception that still prevails in Ducanoi or in other works, even still to come by Poussin, we can see now what they are and the revolution that is taking place. True form in the perspective now being glimpsed is no longer the external form of the object, but the entirely mental form established through the interrelationship of numbers and colors. Here there is something like the transition from the old geometry to algebra and from Pythagoras to Descartes, except that the purpose is not knowledge. Rather, at the moment when the Baroque tends to subordinate painting to architecture, Poussin seeks to enrich the former with the powers inherent to the latter. At the same time, behind the artisan of an aesthetic society, the great and solitary spirit reemerges, who proudly demands that his sheer gaze should become the form that may suffice to assume a destiny. For him, it will be a long and seemingly difficult road, but along it will arise one day these admirable masterpieces which transmute sensual richness into spirit, his landscape with a large path or the ashes of Phocion. The frustrated eye of Poussin's first years in Rome has reconquered the absolute by extracting a novel harmony from the profusion of sensuous givens, unless by an ultimate ambiguity, he was scattered and dissolved in them like that very Phocion. For this alchemy of appearances, is it not, despite everything, the supreme exteriority, and also the denial of love, since on these byways of purely mental delectation, one no longer finds the particular beings to whom alone the heart is attached. 
and I'll stop there. And with this piece of beauty, both in its composition and in its translation, introduce Hoyt Rogers. Hoyt, congratulations. I think you can hear me, but I believe the moderator has uh, cut me out of the video. Can you hear me, Jimmy? I can hear you and I can see you now as well. Oh, you can see me as well, good. Um, I just wanted to say thank you for reading that. That was one of the most beautiful passages. I'm glad you picked up on it. Um, I would like to say a number of things then, and one is that Ibn Fua was for me a spiritual father. I knew him from the age of 19 when I first went to Paris. And at that time I would have weekly conversations with him in his study in um, the Rue Le Pic in Montmartre. And early on, he told me, I think you should read not only Baudelaire, uh, the poet, but also the art critic. You should read his writings about Delacroix, look at the paintings and think about what Baudelaire had to say. So that was, um, a, an introduction to a leitmotif that would continue throughout the 50 years of our friendship. And at the end of 1969, he sent me to Italy. I was in Paris, but he said, I think you should go to Italy at the end of this year and familiarize yourself with Piero della Francesca and all of his great loves. And of course I did that. And um, the ultimate aim of all this was to come back to Paris in the end and go to the Louvre and look at the two magnificent rooms full of Poussins. So, uh, for Bonfoy, this uh, journey through uh, Italian art in particular uh, was a form of gnosis, as he was a word he was fond of using, a slow revelation. And um, he first wrote, in fact, Rome 1630. He was working on it when I first met him in 1969. It was published in 1970 both in Milan and in Paris. And uh, that was significant because the book was about Poussin uh, the Roman and all the other foreign artists who lived in Rome in 1630. It was an international community. And um, that was Bonfoy's vision of, of the period. And he takes that one year, 1630, as the focal point for developing uh, the story of the transition from the high Renaissance to mannerism to the Baroque. And this year, 1630, when the Baldacan was um, built in the Vatican by Bernini, is the year in which he sees the uh, the horizon of the early Baroque, the crystallization of the Baroque. Um, I have always loved this book and I wanted to translate it, even though, as you point out, I had up till then translated mainly his poetry, whether it be in verse or in prose, because he wrote a great deal of poetry and prose, just as Baudelaire had done, and Baudelaire was his master. But I, right now, I would like to thank Richard Howard, who uh, had a wonderful conversation about me, uh, about uh, this book with me uh, in his study in New York. And we thought, well, this would be a wonderful book to translate, but how could you get it published? Because it requires so many illustrations. And that's uh, quite a, a 
a tall order for a publisher. But we did not dream at that time that Seagull books would come into being 10 or 12 years ago, and this would become uh, more possible. Thanks to the vision of uh, Naveen Kishore, the founder of Seagull Books, and I would like to acknowledge him as well, and his um, editor Bishan and his designer um, Sunandini, who worked with me very closely on this book for, it seemed to be an endless time. I think it was really about four years that we toiled away. It was complicated because um, we together, we had to do so much cross-checking to make sure that works of art that at the time Bunfa published the book were in one place, were still in that place and not in another place. And so we did all of that cross-checking uh, to make sure, as he had instructed me to do, because he gave me this, um, uh, together with Seagull, uh, he sponsored, sponsored the translation of this book shortly before his death. He assigned it to me in a number of assignments, you might say, that he made, uh, knowing that he was not long for this world. And in the same way, I translated his last book of poems with his daughter, Mathilde, whom I would like to recognize here as well. And then I almost feel embarrassed that I have won this prize because there are so many great Bonfoy translators, my colleagues, and I would like to recognize them. Um, our doyen, who is Anthony Rudolph, um, and John Naughton, who did so much to um, spread the word about Bonfoy's poetry and poetics in his book, the poetics of Yves Bonfoy in the United States, in the English speaking world. And then there are so many others like Stephen Romer, who translated Bonfoy's last book of prose uh, and Marianne Cause, and the list goes on and on. And so I would just like to um, thank all of my colleagues who have supported my work. We've all supported each other and we were all very much attached to Bonfa. He was our teacher and our friend. And um, I could also say that um, I left off translating uh, Bonfa. I did translate a, a number of things in the late 70s. And then there was a hiatus as I dedicated myself to other things. And I came back to translating his work in um, Early, the early 90s. And when I came back to doing it, we had seen each other in the meantime often, of course. But when I came back to doing it, he said, ah, I am so happy to have you back as a translator because translation is the highest form of friendship. And I will never forget that because I think it's true that if you can have, as Chris has also had apparently with, his, with a, a living author, uh, so much of an interchange, it makes a great deal of, a, of difference. And I really missed that after his death, but I was able to continue it with Mathilde Bonfoy, his daughter, as we translated the final book of poetry. In the case of Rome 1630, I was totally on my own. And there I uh, was faced with a monumental task. This book is quite long uh, in very dense prose. Um, and I enjoyed every minute of it though. I learned so much about Italian art, which was a, a passion that Yves Bunfly and I always shared. And in the course of translating the book. I lived in Europe and I was revisiting 
so many of the works of art. And I spent a lot of time in Brussels um, uh, where I was sort of a jumping off point to go to London, to the National Gallery uh, and all the other places where these works of art are to be found today in the case of the paintings. And so I guess um, I will end my remarks there and ask if you have any questions or anything you'd like to discuss. Um, so uh, one of the things I'd like to ask you about working with Bonfoy and translating Bonfoy is about how you think Bonfoy's own uh, career, his own distinction, let's say as a translator, he's you know one of the a uh, great French trans, probably the great modern French translator of Shakespeare, um, how that plays into uh, your sense of his his language and what you need to do to translate him and and how he understands, how, how both he as a person and, he, and his poems understand the possibility of being translated. It's funny you should ask that because just this morning, I had been looking over some of my old uh, or former books of translation of Bonfoy, and um, I had written an essay about Yves Bonfoy and the art of translation, which I placed at the end of the curved blanks uh, translation of a book of his I did. And um, I talked there at one point about how he proposed early on in his career uh, the whole idea of a recreative process during the course of translation. Um, he published an essay called The Translation of Poetry. And this was actually before he had done most of his major translations of Shakespeare and Yeats and uh, Keats and Leopardi. But he begins by asking a basic question. Can we translate a poem? And in a literal sense, he concludes, we cannot. The original relies on all the givens of its language and these must largely be jettisoned. But that is all the better, he suggests, since a poem is less in poetry. Doing without it spurs us on. Now that's radical, of course. And he goes on to say that instead of replicating the word, we should try to go back to its source. And then he explains this in a key passage of the essay. We should relive the act that produces the poem, the very act that also founders there. Its frozen form is but a trace of the poet's first intention, his primal intuition, call it a longing, an inkling, something universal. By releasing that impulse, we may be able to renew it in another language, all the more authentically, because the poet's own dilemma will arise again for us. The language of our translation, like that of the original, will paralyze the questioning that is our speech. Here is the conundrum we, conundrum we face, while language is a system, the speech of poetry is presence. Yet by grasping that fact, we can draw closer to the author, perceiving more clearly the tyrannies he must endure, the mental strategies by which he counters them, and also the fidelities he needs. I won't go on, but this, what he says there is also true of translating his prose because it was necessary uh, at times because of the different rhetorical structures of English and French um, to change the disposition of phrases and sentences and so forth. But I always had to have as my guiding principle, if Bonfoy had been writing this in English, how would he have expressed it? I think it's also something that one could say about the way in which he talks about painting in this book. That is, he is uh, 
one could, you know, describe what I think you could talk about this not as at any moment a description of the paintings. There's very little ekphrasis uh, in the book, but rather as an attempt to translate uh, the paintings into a different medium. Um, and I'm actually very struck by the uh, by the coherence of this set of issues in, in Bonnefoy with what Cole Swenson was talking about earlier uh, as well. I think that the uh, that all three of our uh, translators today have really shown some of the uh, of the depth of engagement with other people's ideas and other people's culture and other people's languages that translation requires and offers us. And with that, I will congratulate you once again and congratulate uh, Chris Andrews as well and turn the microphone back over to Katie Mealy. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you everyone for coming here today to honor these translators. I'm sure these books will have many more readers after today. We salute you, Chris and Hoyt for your achievement. Uh, thank you again to the Florence Gold Foundation and to our jury without whom this award would not be possible. I'd also like to thank the staff at the foundation in particular Elizabeth McGeehy who has done a tremendous amount of great work on coordination and communication for this program. Uh, to end, I love what Hoyt so beautifully said, translation is the highest form of friendship. We certainly believe that here at the foundation. We hope that discovering these books for you readers is like creating new friends and friendships. Thank you.